everyone's growing and changing. We are live from Melbourne Museum. My name's Elka, hello, and I have Dr. Ken, an entomologist here with me. And today, Dr. Ken, we are joined by over 1,300 students. Wow, that's fantastic. Hello, everybody. Hello, and from many, many schools, I'm actually gonna read out some of the schools. We're gonna read all of the schools to welcome you all. We have Wallen Primary School, Melton Secondary College, Amphitheatre Primary School, West Grove Primary School, St Joseph's in Hawthorne, Epping, Bass Valley, Whittlesea, Preston North and Wallen Primary Schools. We have Witcher Proof Peter 12 College, Birragara Primary School, St Monica's Catholic, Armadale Primary School and Mary Immaculate Primary School, Painesville Primary School, Our Lady of the Pines Primary School, St Margaret Mary School at Spotswood, the Cheshire School at Glen Waverley, Our Lady Help of the Christian Brunswick, uh, Clifton Hill Primary, St Joseph's at Springvale, uh, Home School, Donna, hello, uh, St Agnes um, a Catholic Primary School at, at Hyatt, um, the Clear, uh, Mount Clear Primary School, St Apostle, North Endeavour Hills, and the Mary Creek Primary School. Hello, everybody. Wow. Now, um, Dr Ken, I said you were an entomologist before. What exactly is that? Well, an entomologist is a person who studies insects. Now, there's a lot of different animals out there, and insects are the most common and the most successful of all animals. Can you believe it that one in every five known animals is an insect? And indeed, I have one crawling up my arm just here. Can we go across and have a look at it? I'm going to go across here and have a look. And can you see it there? Hang on, we're just going to go across. This is, this is a stick insect. And they love, they love sitting upside down. If I put it like that, it feels quite uncomfortable. It likes like that because it likes to sit in trees. Now, it can actually feel my breath. And it's moving from side to side to make out as though it's in a tree with a breeze going past it. That's great. So they're really, really cool insects. So we have lots of insects and, of course, there's spiders as well. But that's a different group to the insects. So there we go. That's what, that's what entomologists do. We look after insects. Wow. And do you have a special area of interest in? I do. I have native Australian bees is my speciality. Wow. Do you know that one in every three mouthfuls of food you eat is a direct result of bee pollination? So think of that. Every time you eat a third mouthful, a bee has pollinated it for you. That's incredible. That's good. All right. So among all of the schools that we have today, we actually joined live by St Monica's in Footscray. Can we ha have a big hello to St Monica's? Hello! A Angelina, can you please ask me your question? Can you please ask me your question? Um, why do insects go through metamorphosis? Well, metamorphosis is a way... The word metamorphosis simply means a change of form. That's what it's about. And so insects... and it grows
And I've got a little display here, and I can show you that the really, really successful groups are the beetles. Look at the size of this beetle here. The butterflies and the moths and the flies and the wasps are just some of the really, really successful groups, and these are the ones that have egg larvae pupae adult. Okay? Whereas if we go across to the other side, here I've got a stick insect, and here I've got, it's called a king cricket. It's like a big grasshopper. And in fact, they have got grasshoppers down there. And I've got a leaf hopper there, and a cockroach, and a cicada. These are the ones that have got simple metamorphosis. Okay, so complete metamorphosis, egg, larvae, pupae, adult. And simple metamorphosis that goes from the egg, a miniature version of the adult. So that's what the insect world has got. And there's two forms of metamorphosis and they give us a whole range of different types of insects. Does that help answer your question? We have another question from St Monica's straight away. Good. This is a question from Nereumon. As a caterpillar is in the cocoon and is turning into mush, does it grow anything that has a feature of a butterfly? <laughs> in the pupae, it, all, the, all the tissue turns to mush. And then inside, it begins to form the butterfly. And that's exactly what happens. So it goes from, here's a good example, that this isn't a butterfly, but imagine, imagine how this grub or caterpillar turns into an adult beetle. So here is the grub, and it goes into the pupil stage, and all of the tissue of the grub turns into mush, as you said. And then, during metamorphosis, it begins to grow legs and a head and wings, and finally, out of it, comes the adult beetle. So there's a very good example of how it has to go from a caterpillar or a grub into the mush of a cocoon or a pupa or a chrysalis, and then out of it comes the adult. So all of the change occurs from going to a soup, and then from the soup, everything develops into the adult. That's a great question. Okay, we have another question from St Monica's. Now, St Monica's is a pretty special school because they actually grow and keep butterflies. I think this one has a photo or an image that we need to see too. Did you keep that piece of paper that you had? So when they first received their um, butterfly, it had come out of its out of its cocoon a bit early, oh. and the paper had a stain on it. And, oh. and so Sebastian and Oscar yes. have this question for yes. you. Yes, yes, yes. When the damaged butterfly arrived, it was wrapped in paper, and the paper had a stain on it. What would oh, yeah. this stain be? this pupa to be able to demonstrate it. Now imagine the grub goes into the cocoon. Exactly the same thing that happens with the, with the butterfly. Now all the changes go on but the animal inside is still growing and as the animal is growing it has to poo. But imagine if it pooed inside the chrysalis or the cocoon, it would muck up and it would foul all of where it is sitting there. So what it does is it holds on. It doesn't do a poo from when it's a grub to when it's an adult. But as soon as the adult comes out, that stain that you saw there is the poo, is the poo that the grub inside the cocoon. Yeah, show me that. Show me. Oh. <laughs> name it's called <laughs> it's called meconium that's what we call it or frass is what we call it there as well all right thanks very much dr ken now we are actually joined by another person today here we have patrick honan who is the head of our live exhibits team here at the museum now welcome patrick thank you now um people might not know this but at the museum, we have living animals, and in fact, we have over 120 species of living animals. 
We do. And Patrick's going to talk about some of them that he's bought today. Now, we were talking about the stick insects before, and there's been a question here, another one from St Monica's from Jaden. Jaden, would you like to come forward and ask your question to Patrick, please? What is the process of molting? Um, there's a, a number of stages to molting, and as Dr Ken said, there's, there's two different types of lifestyle, but in both types of lifestyle, the young forms molt throughout their life. And they might, might molt two or three times, they might, might, might molt 40 or 50 times, depending on what sort of insect it is. Now when they, when they shed their skin, this one here is a praying mantis molt. And so the first thing they do is they loosen the old skin. And they do it by um, separating the old skin from the new body. And I should say also that the reason they molt is because they need to molt to grow. So when they molt depends on how fast they're growing. If an insect, and it applies to other animals as well, if an insect's not growing very fast, it won't molt very often. So the faster it grows, the more it molts. And what it does is shed its old skin to give the insect more room to grow. And molting usually takes place at night because when the molting's finished, the insect is very soft and very vulnerable and can't move very fast. In fact, they usually can't move at all. So they're very um, susceptible to being eaten by predators. And so they do it at night and it takes quite often a couple of hours. It's like trying to get out of a very tight fitting wetsuit, if anyone's had a wetsuit before. And so it's a, it's a very long process and they drag their body out of the old skin and the first thing they do when they come out is to fill themselves up with as much air as they can so that as the new skin hardens, they're as big as they can possibly be and that gives them room to grow within the new skin. Wow, that's amazing. So kind of like a balloon, they sort of inflate themselves up. <coughs> they do. Oh, that's... And so they're very, very soft and they also lose their colour. So when they're, they're new, they usually come out white or very pale. And as, the, as time passes over a couple of hours, the, the new skin hardens and also becomes much darker. We've got a number of molts here. Those are insect molts. And these... <coughs> A tarantula molt. So this is the old skin of the tarantula. They shed everything, <coughs> including their eyes and their fangs. And you can see here the lid, the way it molted was the lid lifts off and then the, the, the tarantula drags its body out of its legs, out of its abdomen, out of the front half of the body and leaves the old skin behind. Quite often um, because the old skin still has a lot of protein and other important nutrients in it, quite often they'll eat the old skin, so you'll never find it. In, the, in this case, the tarantulas don't. Can I ask you all a question about molting? Do insects have their skeleton on the inside of their body or the outside of their body? Okay, we might have to ask that Monica's this... If you think they have the skeleton on the inside of their body, put your hands up like this. Dr. Ken, I don't see very many hands up in the air. No, I no, I answer. think they all know that it's on the outside of the body. So insects have got their, their skeleton on the outside of the body. That's the way, exactly. It's called the exoskeleton. And that's why, as Patrick said, as you grow, you have to increase your skeleton. And if it's on the outside of the body, you need a new skeleton. Does that make sense? Absolutely. That's great. That's great. That's really good great. point. Now, I've got an, we've got another animal here that Patrick's brought in for us. Bit of a different process, but this one changes a lot over its lifetime too, doesn't it? Would you like to uh, show that one to the camera? Because yes. I particularly like this animal. I think it's rather spectacular and I think you're going to like it too. So this is a green tree frog. Um, it's quite an old green tree frog. We've had this one for about 17 years 
and it's called Belki. And just under 17 years ago, it was a little tadpole. I'll just pass that over there. So it started off as eggs, and in, in frogs the eggs are known as spawn. So it started off as spawn in a pond somewhere, then the eggs hatched, and they became little tadpoles, as I'm sure you're aware. Then as the tadpoles grew and increased in size and got more mature, the tadpoles started to grow um, legs and the tail on the tadpole started to shrink. And when they got to a certain stage of development, they'll, they'll start to come out from the water onto the ground and then they'll start to hop around and gradually the the tail will disappear until it looks like a tiny little frog and it'll keep growing from there. So when it becomes, moves from being a tadpole to a frog, it'll still be very small. And unlike insects that stop growing when they become adults, the frog will keep growing until it gets the size of the green tree, tree frog you can see there. That's incredible. I had no idea that frogs lived so long. They do, yes. And that's a particularly long growing frog around Victoria. Um, there'll be a lot of people will know the frog calls from around their area and even from their school ground. Mm -hmm. um, most of those frogs only live a few years. The green, frog, green tree frogs tend to be quite long lived. Wow. We're going to have a look at some extra questions in a minute because you've all been contributing questions on the wall, which is fantastic. Thanks so much, guys. Look, we've actually got some questions here from St. Joseph's. So, hello to St. Joseph's. Um, this is from the 3 4. MH class. Um, they have a question, and I might ask Dr. Ken this question. How many years have you studied bugs for? Well, I've been studying bugs for almost 40 years. I've been at the museum for 35 years. So it's a long time now. There are literally millions of species of insects, and there's about two or three hundred thousand in Australia. So as you can see, you can't learn those over one year or two years or five years. It takes a long time. The other th job that I do is that I describe new species of insects. And I've got a group here. Here's a group of bees that I collected. And when I researched them, I found that they hadn't been described before. They weren't known to science. And so I described them, I published them in a paper, and I call them Lassioglossum chylolictus biceps because they had a big lump on their forearms and that's why I call them biceps. So now that name has been added to the total number of insects for Australia and we know about it. Unless we know about a certain species and can give it a name, we can't study it, we can't describe it and we can't talk about it. So that's one of the jobs that I do here and that takes a long time to be able to learn how to distinguish a described species and an undescribed species. Fantastic. So 35 years, guys. You've got a long way ahead. <laughs> um, and one more question for you. What, why did you choose to study insects? Well, that's a, that's a good question. My dad was a birdo. He used to study birds. We used to always, I was always being taken out in the bush and we're looking for all kinds of birds and that. So I've grown up being out in the bush and looking for things all of my life. And in study, in, and instead of taking the, the bird trail that my dad did, I took the insect trail. But really, I could have chosen anything because I just loved being out in the bush and seeing all the nature. So it was my father who introduced me to, to natural history. Fantastic, thank you very much. So that, sorry, that question was from St. Agnes Learning Community. So thank you, St. Agnes, for that. Now, we've got another question here. Have you ever discovered an insect? And, and Dr. Ken's told us a really interesting story then, but Patrick, you've got a pretty cool story too about an insect that you helped rediscover. Uh, yes, with insects in Australia, um, people are discovering insects all the time, new species, uh, because there's so many insects out there and there's so, many, um, so much of the country that's still unexplored. And on live exhibits here at Melbourne Museum, we have a number of insects that are undescribed and some that are newly described, as in they're only, in the last couple of years, they've been given a name that Ken talked about earlier. 
but we've been keeping these insects for 10 years or more. We've known about them, we've known everything about them, but they've just never had a proper name. And um, we actually have a, a type of huntsman called a tiger huntsman at the moment that we discovered probably six or seven years ago. It's a very large, colourful one, and it still doesn't have a scientific name or a Latin name. Um, but the insect that uh, Elka was referring to was one called the Lord Howe Island stick insect, which has been known for more than 100 years. But in the 1920s, it, it seemed to go extinct. It occurs on Lord Howe Island, which is about halfway between Australia and New Zealand. And there were lots of these stick insects on the island until rats accidentally got onto the island and pretty much ate them all. And we thought they were extinct altogether. And for 80 years, no one knew where they were. But about 15 years ago, they were rediscovered. Just a very, very small population. Um, it's only populations probably about 30 insects. And that's all we know of that exist in the wild, in the world. And so we went there, got a pair of them, brought them back to captivity, and they've been reared in captivity ever since. And as opposed to the 30 or so individuals that live in the wild, there's now probably about nearly 14,000 of these insects that have been reared in captivity. So a lot of people think about uh, pandas and tigers and other things when it comes to extinction, but the same thing happens to insects as well. So obviously we, obviously we need to um, take care of the environment as we do for all animals, but we also need to take care of keeping insects in mind because they're just as likely to go extinct as other animals. Great. That's a really good story. That's a great story. Yeah. Thank you. But basically, Patrick's basically bringing it back from the dead. Amazing stuff. All right, we're going to try and get as many of your questions in as possible here. So we have um, a question I will ask both of you. Mernon Primary School wanted to know what your favourite insect metamorphosis is. Uh, I've actually got mine here. If I can get someone to... Show it here. Can you see that butterfly? It's called the Butang Glory. And it lives up near Mount Everest, up in the Himalayas, really high. Why I like it is that the caterpillar takes six years to develop. So it's very cold up there in the summer. It's very short, about a month long. So the caterpillar comes out and it feeds for about a month and then it gets covered with snow. And so it goes in quiet in that. And then it's got to wait for the next 11 months before the next summer comes along for a month. And it feeds again and it gets bigger and bigger. But it takes six years to develop into, to finish its, its development. And then this absolutely beautiful butterfly comes out called the Butane Glory. And the butterfly flies for about two weeks. It lays eggs, dies, and the whole thing starts again. So it's an extremely harsh environment in which it lives. And, and that's the... There's the butterfly at the top, the extremely harsh, very high altitude, very cold, but it survives. It gets through and it takes six years to go through. So that's my favourite insect. Have you got one, Patrick? Uh, mine would be a type of fly. So this fly flies around like all flies do, but the juvenile larval stage of the fly lives underwater. So they live in streams. And as we talked about before, um, you've got your larval stage in the water and in the pupil stage and somehow it has to get from the larval stage underwater to the adult stage above the water. And when, um, when insects come out of a molt or come out of the pupa, they're very soft and very vulnerable. So the, the way they've solved this problem is the larva lives underwater and it forms a pupa underwater, but if the adult was to emerge from the pupa, it'd be soft and vulnerable and it'd get swept away by the stream. So what they do is, when they're ready to emerge, the pupa will start to crack and then it will rise to the surface and as it hits the surface of the water, it breaks open and the fly pops out at the top. So it's almost like a, um, a uh, rocket propelled pupil emergence. So it goes from the bottom of the stream up through the water and then out pops the adult. Hmm. Which is a very clever way to solve that problem. Great, thank you. I'm going to do one last question and then we'll have a wrap up. So, um, St Mary's, St Margaret Mary's in Spotswood wanted to know if insects are still evolving today and are there any examples? 
That's a great question. Um, evolution takes a long time. We estimate it takes about 1.4 million years for a new species of insect to evolve from another, from another form there. But every day they change. Every time that an egg is laid, it's most likely got a little bit of a difference there, a little bit of a genetic difference. And what evolution is all about is testing to see whether the new ones suit the environment and the habitat better. Now, as you know, every day our habitat and environment changes. And so the new forms that come out are always trying to have better food, be able to fly better, to be able to do things much better. So evolution does occur, but it's very slow. We can't actually see it, but if you wait 1.4 million years, you'll see a new species will come out. But every day it's testing and it's trying to be better than the day before. So evolution is a long time, but it happens very slowly. Fantastic. All right, we are going to have to wrap up there. Thank you both very much. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks, Dr. Ken, for Thank your you. time. Thanks, everybody. And um, we've learnt a lot about animals and changing, about how some animals change very dramatically over time through maybe complete metamorphosis or partial metamorphosis, and that how that helps them survive in their environment and find food, or maybe distribute their young or eggs. So, thank you very much. Now, one last question. I can see that we've got a camera on this bug here. We did have um, Mary Immaculate ask, what is the largest bug you've ever seen? Whoa, This yes. is the largest one that Do Dr. Ken Have a look seen. at this one. This is a big centipede, and I've got a ruler here, and it measures about 24 to 5 centimetres in length. It's about that big. That's a big bug. So here it is here. I'll hold it up. And there's my arm. So it's about three quarters the length of my arm. So we'll leave you with a big bug. We will say thank you very, very much for joining us. And we hope to see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.